Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Hope you are doing well. Uh, in today's session, we are going to do my lecture number 66 of my lecture series. And this will be describing the 2023 Bethesda system for reporting the thyroid cytopathology. This was just recently published in the Thyroid Journal just two days ago, so in September 2023. And of course, it's a very important uh, topic for clinical practice, as well as for all the endocrinology board exams. And even in the specialty exam and the European board exam, they frequently like to ask about the Bethesda grading for repeating the reporting the thyroid cytopathology. And this is the latest uh, edition in their uh, guidelines which is a transition from the 2017 Bethesda system for reporting the thyroid setup. So there are some differences which has happened in the current grading, and that's what we're going to look uh, right away. The table one here shows the 2023 Bethesda system for reporting thyroid cytopathology. Now, clearly it has defined the six categories in all, one is first is non-diagnostic. This is cystic fluid only or virtually an acellular specimen or other. If there is an obscuring blood, clotting artifact, drying artifact, this all will be classified as non-diagnostic. Now, what is important to note here is that uh, the unsatisfactory word has been removed from the previous uh, grading of 2017. So in the latest uh, classification, the category one is just non-diagnostic. Number two, we talk about benign. So here they have labeled a follicular nodular disease. This will include adenomatoid nodule, colloid nodule, etc. Before this was referred to as benign follicular nodule. So now they have specified more in detail as follicular nodular disease. Some other things remain the same about chronic lymphocytic, which is Hashimoto's thyroiditis in proper clinical context and also granulomatous subacute uh, thyroiditis, this riddle thyroiditis. This all will be classed into the benign category on uh, the uh, Bethesda grading. Now, grade three of the uh, Bethesda grading for thyroid cytopathology is ATP of undetermined significance. Now, if you see, compared to the 2017 grading, the word or the terminology of follicular lesion of undetermined significance has been removed. So now just category three is ATP of undetermined significance. In this, we should specify if the AUS is nuclear ATP or AUS other. I'll talk about this in the subsequent slides. What is the meaning of nuclear ATP and what is the meaning of AUS other? Because the risk of malignancy is different in both. Category four for the thyroid FNAC results is follicular neoplasm. This we should specify if oncocytic, formerly referred to as Hertel cell type. So uh, again, if you see in this category four, suspicious for follicular neoplasm, which was initially referred to in the category four, has now been removed. And just now it's labeled as follicular neoplasm for cat four. Category five is pretty much similar. It's suspicious for malignancy, for papillary thyroid, medullary thyroid, metastatic, lymphoma, and other. Category six, we have malignant, we have papillary thyroid cancer, we have high grade follicular derived carcinoma. Now, this is a transition from the initial name of poorly differentiated carcinoma. So I've defined it more further in this grading. It is high grade follicular derived carcinoma. So medullary thyroid carcinoma remains the same, anaplastic carcinoma remains the same, squamous cell carcinoma remains the same, carcinoma with mixed features, metastatic, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma all remain the same. So one more differentiation here is the high-grade follicular derived carcinoma is the terminology now coming under malignant, replacing the poorly differentiated carcinoma in the 2017 Bethesda grading. Now, all these categories imply risk of malignancy, and that is very important to note for exam. So if you look at uh, the uh, implied risk of malignancy, this has been updated and refined based on the data reported after the second edition, which was released in 2017. So this is all the risk of malignancy as for the latest update. So very clearly table two specifies the implied risk of malignancy with expected ranges based on the follow-up of surgically resected nodules with recommended clinical management, uh, which we should carry out. 
So if it is non-diagnostic, which is CAT1, uh, mean percentage risk of malignancy is 13, uh, with the range between 5 to 20. The usual management is repeat and FNA with ultrasound guidance. Now, important things here are that studies have shown diagnostic resolution with repeat FNA. And the other statement, which is important to note, the risk of malignancy varies with the type and structure of the nodule. Solid versus complex is almost uh, versus 50% for cystic. So non-diagnostic aspects from solid nodules are associated with a higher risk of malignancy compared with those showing more than 50% cystic changes or low risk ultrasound features. So this is an important thing to note these two statements in context of the uh, non-diagnostic category. Benign four is the risk of malignancy range between two to seven, which is to a clinical and ultrasound follow-up. ATP of undetermined significance, which is the AUS, mean risk of malignancy is 22%, range between 13 to 30. Repeat FNSE is one of the most uh, uh, suggested of usual management, and or we do molecular testing or diagnostic lobectomy or surveillance. We'll be looking at all this in the subsequent slides. Follicular neoplasm, the risk of malignancy is 30%, range between 23 to 34. Again, molecular uh, testing, or diagnostic lobectomy. Now, in this regards, if I, I were to look at uh, suspicious of malignancy, 74% risk of malignancy, very high risk. 67 to 83 is the range, molecular testing, lobectomy, or near total thyroid victim. Malignant is, of course, 97% risk of malignancy, range between 97 to 100. You do a lobectomy or near total thyroid victim. So, it's important in all of this case scenarios like of categories one, two, three, four, five, and six that we know the risk of malignancy because that's what we commonly encounter in the exams for the questions and then the recommended usual management. So a bit about uh, non-diagnostic cases, a repeat aspiration with ultrasound guidance is recommended for cytologically non-diagnostic nodules and this can yield up to 60 to 80 percent uh, uh, this can be, uh, give us a yield in about 60 to 80 percent of the cases, particularly in nodules with smaller cystic compound. Now, what about the regarding the interval for repeating an FNAC after an initial non diagnostic FNA? The data are slightly conflicting. Some studies have clearly depicted lower diagnostic yields if repeat FNA is performed sooner than three months. However, the previous approach of waiting for three months before a repeat FNAC seems to be less crucial. Currently, the ATA. Uh, guidelines now state that there is no need to even wait several months before repeating an FNA. In context of category two, which is benign, as I already mentioned to you in my previous slide, we have a more detailed uh, terminology called follicular nodular disease. And this is preferred to all the spectrum of changes which were previously designated as colloid nodule, hyperplastic nodule, adenomatous nodule, or benign follicular nodule. All of this are now termed into follicular nodular disease in this classification. And this is in line with the WHO classification of thyroid tumors, which was released in 2020. A bit about AUS, uh, as I already mentioned to you that uh, the terminology of follicular lesion of undetermined significance has now been discontinued. Uh, it is more of a definite category now of AUS. It is reserved for cases with atypia that is insufficient for either of the two indeterminate categories of follicular neoplasm and suspicious of malignancy, which are basically category four and five. Of course, among the three indeterminate uh, categories, AUS has the lowest risk of malignancy. We already looked at this chart, which shows follicular neoplasm with 30 and suspicious of malignancy with 74% risk of malignancy. Now, specifically AUS with nuclear atypia, I mentioned to you that in the first slide, uh, those with the nuclear ATP has significantly higher risk of malignancy compared with AUS associated with other patterns, particularly those characterized by architectural ATP alone or a predominance of oncocytes. So in the AUS category, we should know whether it is having a nuclear ATP or other pattern because the nuclear ATP has a higher risk of malignancy compared to the other patterns. So this is very important to note for uh, that reason. Let's move on to the follicular neoplasm to ensure a clear and unambiguous communication. Again, the current uh, the system uh, discontinued the use of the term suspicious of molecular neoplasm. Now they only refer to as 
Follicular neoplasm is the sole name for this category. This category is intended for aspirates that are at least moderately cellular and composed of follicular cells, most of which show significant architectural abnormality in the form of microfollicles and a crowding of reticulin or single cell. Now, a bit about molecular markers. Uh, this is not from the guidelines, but this is from up to date, and uh, it is uh, giving us an idea about the molecular markers available. Previously, majority of patients with cytological results of follicular lesion of undetermined significance, as was in the old system, or AUS, or follicular neoplasm, confirmed on repeat aspiration had diagnostic thyroid surgery. So most of these patients used to have a diagnostic thyroid surgery, usually lobectomy. However, most patients, 75 to 95% had surgery for what was ultimately confirmed to be a benign disease. So they ended up having a surgery for a benign disease. So how can we help to aid the diagnosis more better? So improvement in assessment of indeterminate FNAC results with molecular testing allows for better risk stratification and reduces the need for diagnostic thyroid surgery. In addition, patients whose surgical histology shows a follicular thyroid cancer or a follicular variant of papillary thyroid cancer may need to return for completion thyroidotomy, depending on whether radioiodine is being contemplated based on tumors, pathological characteristics, and other factors. Mutational analysis appears to decrease the need for completion thyroidectomy, as illustrated by a study comparing routine with no molecular testing in all patients with FNAC, results showing an indeterminate category. The use of routine mutational analysis reduced the number of patients with initial lobectomy who had to return for completion therapy. However, long-term data is still lacking. The available tests are three. There are three approaches to molecular characterization of FNA aspirates that are widely commercially available in the USA. These are identification of a particular molecular marker of malignancy, such as BRAF or RAS mutation states, use of high-density genomic data for molecular classification, a genomic sequencing classifier, which is GSC, or use of an FNA trained microRNA classifier combined with the molecular markers of malignancy, as mentioned above, which is BRAF and RAS. Now, a bit about NIFTP. Increasingly, we see these being reported nowadays. In the past, encapsulated follicular variant of papillary thyroid cancer without evidence for either vascular or tumoral capsular invasion were considered non-invasive variants of papillary thyroid cancer. However, non-invasive encapsulated follicular variants of papillary thyroid cancer had a very low malignant potential and were uniformly cured with lobectomy. Because of the very low malignant potential, this type was then renamed as non-invasive follicular neoplasm with papillary-like nuclear features, which we refer to as NIFTP, emphasizing that this tumor can be managed as a neoplasm rather than a malignancy. Both the ATA and the WHO have endorsed this change in the nomenclature. While thyroid surgery is definitely required to distinguish NIFTP from encapsulated with the invasive subtype, therapy beyond thyroid lobectomy is usually not needed. So basically, they don't need uh, completion thyroidectomy, they don't need TSS suppression, and they don't need radioactive iodine ablation. Now, table four basically reports the decrease in the risk of malignancy of the Bethesda system for reporting thyroid cytopathology if we have excluded the nodules which were diagnosed by surgical pathological examination as NIFTP. So if you can see, then in this scenario, there is a decrease in the risk of malignancy if excluding NIFTP. Non-diagnostic comes down to 1.3, benign comes down to 2.4, AUS comes down to 6.4, follicular neoplasm comes down to 7.1 in the mean, suspicious for malignancy 9.1, and malignant 2.6 in this regards. And the estimated final uh, risk of malignancy if excluding NIFTP also reduces significantly in terms of mean percentage. If you look at it is 12 for non-diagnostic, 2 for benign, ATP of undetermined significance 16, follicular neoplasm 23, suspicious for malignancy 65%, and malignancy 94%. So if we were to exclude the reduced diagnosed by surgical pathological examination as NIFTP, then we will have a drop in the estimated final risk of malignancy. Also included in this latest update is a discussion of pediatric thyroid disease and pediatric risk of malignancy has been included. So here we can just quickly uh, go through the risk of malignancy in pediatric patients, okay? Non-diagnostic 14, 
benign, 6, AUS 28, polyclonal present 50, suspicious for malignancy 81, and malignant 98% risk of malignancy. The non diagnostic repeat FNA with ultrasound guidance, benign clinical and ultrasound follow up, ATP of undetermined significance, repeat FNA or surgical resection, follicular neoplasm, suspicious of malignancy and malignancy, the category of four, five, six need to proceed with surgical resection in the pediatric patients with implied risk of malignancy. A bit about the category six, just wanted to mention to you here now, the term papillary thyroid carcinoma variance is now changed to papillary thyroid carcinoma subtypes, and this is in line with the WHO tumor classification of 2022. The previously recognized subtype of papillary thyroid cancer, which is cribriform variant, is now designated as a separate tumor entity. And as I mentioned to you in my first slide, the new term high-grade follicular derived thyroid cancer is now endorsed, which replaces the older nomenclature of poorly differentiated thyroid. So I tried to put all the differentiation from the 2017 update, 2017 update, and this is as per the latest 2023 Bethesda class. So this was a full session on the Bethesda 2023 classification. This was my lecture number 66. I have 65 other lectures which covers various topics across endocrinology and diabetes, very helpful in clinical practice, as well as uh, uh, different endocrinology exams. For subscribing to my full lecture series, please message me on my WhatsApp number, which is 00971557434794, or email me on mazzeroes at gmail.com. I'll be trying my best to put on more and more of the latest guidelines and updates. And of course, all my previous lectures are case-based based on the guidelines. Thank you so much.